and welcome to Gehenna Gaming in conjunction with Darker Days Radio and Dark Hammer presenting Let's Play Wrath and Glory. And so I'm obviously joined by Ian from Gehenna Gaming. Hello, Ian. Hello, and welcome to a Gehenna Gaming surprise stream of Warhammer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are also joined by my Dark Hammer uh, co host, David. Hi. Sorry, I was just choking to death then. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You're going to choke some more, but don't worry. Um, and we are joined by Crystal, Mike, and Chig from Darker Days Radio, of course. Hello, everyone. Hey, Chris. Hello, Chig. Is Mike doing okay? He might be playing with something right now, trying to sort out some com computer issues, but don't worry. We'll get to him soon enough. And uh, yes, we're playing Wrath and Glory in its revised form because this new rule book came out, what? when thursday yeah it was yeah. thursday yeah, yeah. Thursday. and uh, yeah, wednesday so this is cubicle seven's revised version of wrath and glory which was previously released by ulysses spiel in north america so we have a representation of the rules representation of the material and it's a book which i have written for so it's great um of course it's great i'm going to show my own stuff but don't worry about that um so what we're doing right now is we're going to do a session zero we're going to get used to what the system is, get used to character creation, figure out what everyone's playing. And from there, we'll be in a position to play through the published, the already published campaign book that was done for the original edition uh, called Dark Tides, which we're gonna, I'm gonna obviously have to do, do some cleanup for because it has to meet how the new rule system works, of course. So that's my homework. But everyone else is obviously going to be making characters in the stream. And also the important thing about this stream is that we have people like Ian and people like Crystal who are, and maybe Chig even, who are less, um, less informed, less no knowledgeable about the 40k universe. So it's going to really be also an opportunity for people who, have, who are used to things like Vampire, used to things like Cult and Call of Cthulhu, those type of horror games, who you know, on the tangent, might understand what I've heard about 40k, but don't really know what it is. I will say, I did play the war game version once yes. in college okay. when my friend was like, I really want to play. Here are all my dark elves. Please play. And I was like, I don't know why I do what I'm doing, but it was fun. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's, that's <laughs> at least a little bit of a start um, because there are basically space elves in this game. Uh, and yeah, you it's know, Myself and David have worked for Games Workshop as well, uh, part-time in shops when we were undergrads. That was fun times. Um, we won't right. talk about how long ago that was. That was too long ago. Um, <laughs> too long. Uh, eons. Eons and eons ago. Yeah. Um, so where shall we begin? Uh, I think I, I should really give like a preface to what is the setting. Okay. So it's the end of the 41st millennium. And humanity has spread through the stars and is beset on all, from all fronts by alien invaders, raiders, and has been riven by heresy and corruption over thousands of years. And humanity is on the precipice of either complete and utter collapse or perhaps its greatest salvation. And... This is where we're thrust into in this game. So at this current point, there are so many different wars. It would take, you know, just go listen to Dark Hammer. You'll find out a lot. But the main point is there is the Imperium of Mankind that has existed for nigh on 10,000 years. And at its head is the God Emperor, who is this psychic, um, this enormously powerful psychic who's, nigh, who's effectively a god who created this Imperium uh, wanted to rid it of uh, superstition, corruption, and demonic incursions, and essentially usher humanity into its next age, as humanity was about to blossom in its psychic ability. That all goes bad. That all goes really bad. There's a massive heresy. The emperor is mortally wounded and is incarcerated on holy terror on a throne, from which he is the one beacon of light in the galaxy that in literal it literally is a beacon of light because space travel is relies on his presence in in effect space travel relies on jumping into 
an alternate dimension where all your psychic ability, all your emotions, all of that manifests. And it's manifesting and also giving form to demons and so forth. So, you know, think of an inky blackness of space with also faces of demons and various, various other psychic entities out there. And that's basically what the warp is. And traveling through the warp allows fast and light technology, allows you to travel in a blink of an eye to another world, but other bad things can happen. Now, there are also within the Imperium, the space marines, the Adeptus Astartes, who are these grandiose, almost, let's call them Nephilim. They are humans that have been elevated above being humans. They are also in their own right, almost considered gods. They are bound in uh, armor, which has been blessed, uh, because religion has an importance in this setting as well, that be belief in the emperor, belief in, in, in wanting to do the justice and, and the good things is what fights against chaos. So space rings are part of that. Good. And they are, yeah, crazy superhumans. Uh, they numerate on, you know, there, there are many thousands upon thousands of them, but there are millions more of Imperial Guardsmen, regular humans also fighting on the front lines. And yes, you know, they, they're, they're the people that really fight for humanity. There are other elements such as the Adeptus Mechanicus who are essentially a machine cult. Uh, there are also groups uh, like the Inquisition who fight to root out corruption. And then there are rogue traders. These are humans of, of uh, dynastic families who have the, who've been given the 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 right to travel beyond the realms of the Imperium to to talk to the untrustworthy aliens and Xenos out there to find lost technology and hopefully humanity salvation. Things obviously in the last few few years at the tail end of the 41st millennium went really bad. We've had heresies, you've had corruption, you've had civil wars, and the Imperium has weathered all that. You've had invasions from orcs, you've had the Eldari raiders, all of those things. You've had the chaos demonically corrupted space marines invading from the Eye of Terror. And this all culminates with a world called Cadia basically being blown up and warp storms, which were essentially uh, an incursion of the um, incursion of the warp into real space, have riven through the galaxy. And there is something now known as the Great Rift that runs from one side of the galaxy to the other. That has an impact on space travel. So there's the one part of the Imperium, which can easily be traveled through, and, and uh, people can get from Earth to other parts of of other parts of the galaxy on that side. But then there's the part known as the Imperium uh, Nihilus, the, basically the, the Night Empire. And the only way to get there is by some means finding a way through the Great Rift, which, as I said, spreads across the entire galaxy. And so far, there's only been one place where you could travel through, and that was near the world of Vil Vigilis. And that's an absolute war zone. But now there is another crossing point. There is a crossing point which leads to, to the, the Gilead system, which is the focus of our campaign and where our characters will be, you know, investigating corruption, heresy, bringing worlds back into the rulership of the Imperium and other crazy things. Because the 40k universe is expansive, covers many genres, many different themes, and is grandiose, dark, baroque, medieval and also completely you know fantastical crazy sci-fi at the same time so i hope that gives you at least a feel for the mood of it there as i said there are demons there is corruption there is that feeling of paranoia but then there's also eldritch entities which will conspire in plans that have taken thousands upon thousands of years to to, to really come to fruition cool <laughs> I, I'm excited. So, like I like I mentioned earlier, I know virtually nothing about Warhammer other than what I've kind of been downloading, uh, yeah, into my head over the last two days, um, and also the brief amount I got to watch during Virtual Horicon. So, I have chosen a character to play, but I okay. know very little about the game other than what you basically told me previously and just now. So, very excited to 
dive into it and get a better understanding as we go through this session zero. Excellent. Um, how are we doing audio? I think Mike and Chick are still playing with things. Or have we got Chick there? Is he there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Here. We yep. can hear you from the void. Yep. Great. And uh, and Mike is Mike is uh, Mike has a very high ping right now, so I will be playing the part of Mike. <laughs> okay. So Mike Mike is having clear issues with Astropaths and the warp. So we will deal with him at a later point once hopefully he is sorted. Um, so um, who wants to go first with kind of like what kind of character concept we want to play? So. I think first off, before we get into that, um, Wrath and Glory has different tiers of play. So you can play tier one, lowly guardsman, bog standard kind of grunt type characters. Tier two, you're a bit more competent. Tier three, that's when you can start playing space marines. Tier four, that's where you start playing Primaris space marines, inquisitors, the type of characters capable of uh, like demanding- D declaring like exterminatus on entire worlds, entire systems. They're that level of character. Um, but we're playing tier two, which is essentially the crew of a rogue trader ship. So you are part of uh, Lord Veronius Flotilla, which has come into the Gilead system uh, had, and he is looking to stamp his claim on, on the worlds there, bring them back into the Imperium. Uh, start taking the tithe of uh, what is owed to the Imperium. Sorry, my tablet's just uh, gone quiet on me just then. Um, and within that, uh, you know, you, you've got quite a lot of options that you can play. So when I say bridge crew, we're talking about really the the, the cadre of characters of people. He would that Lord Veronius would go. I need you to deal with this because this isn't quite something I have to pay attention to, but I trust you to, to deal with things on my behalf. So you're going with, with a badge of, of, of his authority. So you can really pull rank on quite a few people. Ooh. So within that scope, um, you know, character creation will mean there's a certain number of XP. You can play characters that are designed specifically for that tier, or you can play lower tier characters and kind of, you know, you can, pay XP to get experience packages that bring them up to that level and really flesh them out as uh, a character that's been around for a while. So you're not just some guardsman, you're like some grizzled veteran who's like seen the wars of Cadia, who or has been on the front lines on Armageddon and all these other godforsaken worlds. Okay. So um, who wants to go first with their character, what character they concept they're picking? Um, so there's a couple of us who have never really played this before, um, including myself, but I have spent a good amount of time talking to you and figuring out my concept. So if it was helpful, I can go first and we'll kind of talk first. through it since it'll yes. be introducing the character creation yes. process. So I will be playing a death cult assassin. Excellent. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, this is Blood like shock witch. face right here, Ian. <laughs> you know me too okay. well, Crystal. <laughs> so, so Ian, you, I, I linked you to a few things mm -hmm. off, off wikis and so forth. De Death Cult Assassins first turned up in Inquisitor back in two thousand and three, two thousand. Yeah, the the actual the, the seventy two mil tabletop game. Yeah, um, yeah. You're basically playing uh, a holy zealot who who is who believes death is uh, your death and the death of others mm -hmm. is a holy right. That's not uh, look at it. <laughs> much like what the emperor went through since he is now a uh, literally a corpse on a throne. Right. So death is death is for you a a transference to a higher plane eventually. Or at least that's what your faith believe, uh, leads yeah. you to believe. There are other things involved in that. Um, I believe that you, your tithe back to your your holy order, you send back like vials of blood that you take from your uh, assassination targets. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's fun. Uh, you are a blood drinker and a flesh eater, so you can basically you consider that once you consume blood or flesh, that is a very holy act, mm -hmm. and it becomes blessed in doing so. Right. Um, which is really kind of an inversion of Catholicism somewhere along the lines there. Um, inversion, yeah, almost the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and yeah, you're you're a complete hand-to-hand -hand combat 
master yeah. essentially mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else um you want to expand on that because there's quite a few different orders on that wiki that uh, yeah explain... actually gonna pull that up real quick on my side as well because there was a, a couple things i did have some quick questions about um so there's there are specific death cults i can be a part of so kind of like emperor's yeah. blades the faceless um winged skull can you kind of just give a summary of the different cults uh i haven't got it up on my thing on my computer right now uh, if you've got it in front of you do you want to just rattle off a few interesting points i think the faceless are quite interesting in the fact that they they take various drugs to mm -hmm. uh, manipulate themselves uh they all either have the same face or they can disguise themselves their flesh is very yep. uh plasticine uh, in in its way uh the house of blade was it order of blades or house of blades uh, uh i just uh, emperor's blades emperor's blades what are they like what does it say yeah in so let me let me, let me jump through real quick so emperor's blades um are apparently um a cult that is very puritan in how they approach their faith uh they communicate using an intricate form of sign language um as well as ritual a ritual form of death blows um they basically are assassins for hire but you have to hire them by giving them a vial of blood uh taken and then um they then bring that back uh for their devotion to the excellent um to, let's see the uh hemivores um believe that to spiritually to be spiritually strong one must be physically strong um so they're kind of like a the ultimate predator type they're um cannibals in the extreme uh they're the ones with like they sharpen their teeth they have metal jaws they carry utensils specifically for like eating other humans um which is hmm. interesting uh not leaning in that direction well i'll go back to that uh mm -hmm. the faceless of like you said are much more on the um i'm waiting um they have a philosophy of everyone but no one they use ritual brainwashing and plastic surgery to all have identical appearances but they do have this like very plasticky kind of non-human-esque appearance um they also use drugs to kind of neurologically um wipe them to be kind of not have much personality um that one's actually really interesting to me because it kind of aligns with the concept i have in mind okay um, that's quite interesting because i guess wiping their personality is also quite useful for keeping secrets of mm -hmm. of of who's hired them and uh, and various bits like that so that's kind of fun uh, there's a couple other cults, but they're um, not as well known or uh, don't have as much detail other than the Moritat, um, which are an older cult. Um, and they have there's a lot of background on them. Um, but they also appear to be... Uh, they teach that only through bloodshed can those who are corrupted or un unworthy be removed. And then by doing so, they honor their sacrifice to the emperor. Um uh, very focused on blood, blood of martyrs who have died in service. Um, they're, they're also the ones that are like hyper focused on edged weapons, swords, the power blades, things like that. I'm leaning towards faceless though. Okay, cool. That's uh, uh well, that's a fun start then. So we have a death cult assassin who's likely going to be armed with some pretty sharp swords. Yes. Um, or or something like that. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, David, you've mostly got quite a good idea of what you want to play already. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, um, I'm just going to go through some things to work out where I so completely forgot about Forge Worlds. But yeah, cool. Um, so I'm going to be playing um, a Skitari from the Adeptus Mechanicus. Uh, okay. Skitari are kind of these guys behind me. <laughs> for the pictures, these are. Um, that ex-soldiers who have been taken over by the Adeptus Mechanicus and repaired, in a way, so they've, they've got augmentations, they've become quite robotic in their life, um, and they've had complete memory wipes as well. So um, they are quite fun, they are very robotic, and they have stupid names. <laughs> um, 
like Zelith Delta 27 in the book, I'm probably going to go for something computer related. Okay. So, yeah. Well, 99 um, just for comedy value? So, yes, yeah, Skitari are, um, let's summarize, Skitari are cyber augmented warriors for the Adeptus Mechanicus. So, the Adeptus Mechanicus originated on Mars. Uh, they so in the far future, technology and its understanding of technology has almost become treated more like a religion. Uh, yeah. It's uh, It has to be... There have been points in the history of the Imperium where technology has led to great turmoil, or even before the Imperium, uh, there was a point where AI, or abominable uh, in intelligence, took over, almost <laughs> destroyed mankind. So AI is banned, true AI is banned. Uh, and because so much technology has been lost, as said, like the, the Adeptus Mechanicus look after it, but there's a, some of them don't really understand quite what they're doing. They just go through the motions and, tr and those yeah. are ritual, ritualistic rites that they perform to the Omnisire, the God machine. Uh, and in the Emperor's grand crusade to bring humanity back under control he essentially uh orchestrated with the adeptus mechanicus that he was an embodiment of the omnisire uh so that's how the adeptus mechanicus is meant to believe things obviously there are some factions within them and rogue um rogue uh, uh tech mechanicus. adepts who don't believe that and are doing things they really shouldn't do so yeah, you're a machine warrior. Cool. Yeah, pretty much. Um, within this, I am pretty much a machine warrior. I'm not any level up. I'm not in tech race. At tier two, you only get a base machine Excellent. warrior. Excellent. I'm um, just going to turn He's pretty on much going to be. <laughs> yeah, he is going to be your long range tank because he's made of uh, robots, robot parts. He is very, very, very tough. Um, but he also has some. They have some because they worship machinery and they spend a lot of time perfect, trying to perfect old machinery um, they have some very very powerful weapons it's like the idea that you're made of robots <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much um the description I've, I've, I've just got the description up here and it's a uh, quite quite nice skitarius are survivors of drooling transformations flesh is stripped and replaced with synthetic fiber and adamantium limbs are replaced from untiring augmetics, armor plating, bolted to bone. So they are they are true cyborgs in a way. Um, they have had their memory wiped, but they still have mostly a human brain. To, yes. To, to kind of as, as close as you can put it um, before it becomes a, a fully cybernetic brain. At this cool. point, the character, he will still have a, a human brain. He's not gone that far down it. Um, he's probably maybe only 20, 30 years through his transformation. Um, and so they do the Admech, especially the Skotari, as they find more bits and pieces start to get blown off them, they'll replace more and more bits with other augmentations and stuff. And when you go through the actual character generation, you do get to choose certain augmentations and actually create what kind of robot you want to go for. Um, yeah. And so when we get to that part of it, I'll kind of go through more of those things. But they are, they're religious psychotic robot killers. Mm, nice. So, so we're Excellent. both playing psychotic killers. Yeah. Yeah. Holy you psychotic close. killers. I'm far. Yes. Killers, yeah. I think Remember we're me. all playing psychotic killers. Isn't that the name <laughs> yeah, of the game? That is 40k. Yeah. Um, okay, There's so. There's a good side. Honest. Let's move on. Uh, Crystal, what are you going to play? Um, so I would like to play a commissar. A commissar, yeah, interesting. What do you know about commissars, Crystal? Have you read anything about them much? Or a shall little, I go into it? A little bit, but I would like to hear um, mm. you uh, fill in like the gaps that I have. Okay, right. So I'm just fine bringing up a page on. Okay, so yeah. we have the Imperial Guard, which is essentially basic, regular humans conscripted from thousands upon thousands of worlds to fight. Uh, obviously they've got ranks within them like sergeants and various commanders and so forth. A commissar is exactly that. They are a, um, they are a, uh, how can you say, a political officer. You're ensuring that the soldiers and their higher ups 
are following the imperial creed. They're following all the rules and regulations of the Imperium. And if anyone falls out of line, you know, you could say they should be doing something like, you know, clearing out the uh, the toilets or might have to be just going on burying bodies for, for their duty. No, most of the time though, the best way to deal with people that step out of line is to take your bolt pistol, put it to the back of the head and pull the trigger. Uh, so, um, you, as a character, you will have been brought up as either you will have been inducted into or you will have been an orphan and sent to the Scholar Proginium. Is that right, David? Uh, I think we had discussions about this, didn't we, a couple of weeks ago? We did, on, yeah. It's in a Dark um, Hammer episode, but you were sent yeah. to a, a school. It's okay. kind of like a private office. Scholar Proginium sounds about right. And many of them, uh, many. Uh, the students that you've been brought up with that have been coming there will have either become commissars themselves, they would have become uh, military officers, or they would have become commanders of great starships, or they would have become uh, members of the Adeptus Arbites, which is essentially space police of the Imperium. Um, and also, may, the rare few of them uh, will have gone off and become members of the Inquisition. They will have been uh, taken on at that point. So reading this, yeah, you maintain high morale by any means necessary. You're a leader amongst the Yastra Militarum, ensuring soldiers do their duty by leading from the front. Uh, yeah, interesting. Um, standing tall from the front. battle, uh, Commissar's piercing gaze penetrates the souls of their soldiers and sneers disdainfully at the Imperium's enemies. When a trooper's will breaks, the Commissar drags them to their feet. So yes, you have gone through some serious psychological training to make sure grunts from any world do what they do. So whereas most sergeants and most commanders of platoons of a, of a regiment of the Imperial Guard will come from the same planet, you don't have to. You are brought in for that group for one task, and that's to make sure they do their bloody job. And so it's quite likely that you have gone through uh, a number of different battles, and now you're on a, you're on this, this you've mostly been picked up by the captain and, or, or by Lord Veronius, but just, just generally because he thought, you do good work. I need someone that when there's the need to really instill upon someone, they ha should conform to the, to the laws of the Imperium. You're kind of the best person to send in to, to really berate someone. And, and if he needs to also bring into line his own regiment of Imperial Guardsmen, you're one of the people that will do that for him because on your ship that you mostly that you there's a number of ships in the flotilla on the ship there's in the flotilla there's more than likely about something like five thousand to almost ten thousand guardsmen ready to deploy at any one moment because that's what you know essentially a rogue trader is his own army his own fleet of his own and he can conduct wars wherever he sees fit which is complete insanity so yeah you you lead when needed, you lead a thousand people. I lead insanity. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about this. Uh, the Gilead system needs those that won't hesitate to commit any necessary evils to uphold the laws of the Imperium. Uh, yeah, um, that's you. You are, <laughs> you, and there's some, the thing is, there's been some really, really great, there's a really great miniature recently, which is of a female commissar and it's like such yeah. a most badass and it's just she just stood there with a, her cuirass which is not boot plate but it's a proper cuirass she's got a bolt pistol in one hand she's got a sword ready she looks just like she can like just turn around to like 10 guardsmen and kill half of them and go there that was that was a worthwhile punishment to get the remaining half to do their job nice it's awesome. great <laughs> excellent um Right, Chig, what are you playing? Uh, I would like to play a Sister of Battle. <gasps> wow, okay. <laughs> they sound real fun. <laughs> yes, yeah, they are quite fun. Uh, they recently got their first plastic miniatures, um, which yeah. is amazing. So, so, so Sister of Battle are a, um, a part of the ecclesiarchy, uh, the Church of the God Emperor of Mankind. And so you are a militant order uh, of, of essentially warrior nuns. 
uh, is the best way to describe it. Uh, you have much, many of the same pieces of equipment and armor as space marines. You just don't have the superhuman um, element to you. And there's been a totally um, unnecessary. Yeah, there's a long history. I can get by on faith. Yeah, faith. Faith is uh, an important thing. Um, faith and flamers. So yes, uh, much like the commissar, um, you you go through your initial training in the Scola Progenum. Uh, as an orphan uh, of some soldiers on some awful world and you're educated in the imperial creed and then at some point you will have been selected to be inducted into the sisters of battle uh the adeptus uh the adepta sororitas um, sororitas yes sororitas and you work in conjunction with the inquisition as well so you root out heretics demonic infestation or maybe Xenos infestation. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for you. That's that's what you're playing. You're playing someone that's wearing power armor, so you're pretty badass. And you have a bolt gun, so that's all good. Uh, I have a bolt pistol oh, you've and got a chain pistol. sword. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> a good choice. Um, yeah. I, the other thing is, is that while characters can have psychic power, so you can play a psyker, um, you all the characters because we're all playing Imperium, you're all playing Imperium characters. You're all actually capable of taking not just talents but also acts of faith. So you can actually make a, you can do a prayer and it will actually have an effect. So you are all kind of clerics in your own weird death cult kind of way. Okay. So that's fun. Cool. Okay, uh, do we have sound from Mike, or is Mike still in limbo? If we don't, I have his uh, his character information here. He sent it to me. Yes! What's Mike planning on playing? Uh, Mike would like to play a beast man. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so how do I go about explaining this? Um, <laughs> well, he, uh, he has, a, he has a, a long thing here, so if you want, I can okay. just read that. <laughs> I was going to read quickly. Um, so one of the character types is Scavi. So Scavis are is a slang term for mutants because the corruption due to technology, the corruption due to pollution, the corruption due to heresy, and due to the machinations of the chaos gods can lead to humans being mutated uh, over time or born mutated. Now, most mutants are seen as something that should essentially be killed on sight, though mutants do exist at the fringes of imperial society, and some are able to uh, get by by disguising their mutations, some which could be quite benign, their skin could look quite you know, rocky, or they might have fanged teeth, uh, or they might have just a few extra fingers and toes. Uh, but others do have more um, pronounced mutations, let's just say. They might have an extra arm, they might have tentacles, they might have an extra mouth that's on their chest or some other weirdness. Now, Mike is playing a type of mutant which we could mostly also say counts as an abhuman. So it's a stable yeah. type of mutation that occurs within the Imperial society, much like ratlins, which is basically space halflings or squats, which is space dwarves, or ogren, which is space ogres. You know, let's just make it as simple as that. Uh, Mike is playing a beastman, which if you've played Warhammer, if you know anything about classic Warhammer or Age of Sigma, is a typical ab human. So Mike is playing a character which has, uh, let's just say has um, goat-like features. He has uh, the classic goat-like eyes, he has horns, uh, he might even have cloven feet. Uh, but, you know, normally that would be seen as uh, quite the uh, outsider that should be killed on sight, but for some reason Lord Veronius is like, no, I like this guy. Uh, because there are certain parts of society where someone like Chig's Sister of Battle or Crystal's Commissar are just not going to be accepted. But this beastman is just the person to send in uh, because they'll just talk to him like he's a regular Joe, a regular mutant Joe, but a regular Joe nonetheless. Uh, so that is what Mike is going to play. So he's going to be having some fun with selecting as part of his archetype from the mutations table. He's going to be picking some mutations, which obviously is going to be some horns and some other fun in there. In there. Um, 
and like his equipment is nothing compared to say the commissars or the sister of battle or mm. or uh, or the uh, the skitari but he is still a useful um combatant and explorer and potentially diplomat in the right context so with that i think we're we're happy with what the character concepts are we can run through kind of what um character creation is going to entail i think everyone's got access to the rule book and we can go through the steps now the thing is that people that are new to this game might want to go ah oh, do i really need to go through the minutia of where do i spend my xp that takes a while um you don't have to so for every character concept we have here you can go through to the archetype and you'll find there is an xp cost for that archetype so it gives you its keyword abilities it gives you its uh suggested attributes that you need to spend xp to bring you up to um and also the uh archetype ability and the war gear they come with automatically and then you've also got listed under the suggested attributes that they should take and again the xp cost for those so they can you know have the recommended strength and toughness or number of attacks and then after that there are the suggested skills that they should have and after that there's a list of talents so some of these things have got xp costs and they're already include that if you pay the xp cost you get it flat out straight some things are just suggestions that you might take so if we're quite, I will just check with that XP cost on the floor, how much XP you need to purchase this archetype and then uh, suggested attributes. Yeah, attributes six, what's six? Uh, the attributes, yeah, so the, so lists on the archetype, the attributes listed are the ones included with the archetype as you purchase it. So if you're playing, uh, for example, uh, let me just find the, the right example. Um, if we're playing Chig's Sister of Battle, uh, she's a tier two character that costs 94 XP to buy basic, okay, which is a lot out of your out of your 200. Yeah, but that does include straight away strength three, toughness three, agility three, and willpower three, plus the other skills because they're just yeah. standard. Yeah. Yeah, kind of a better. Yeah, I was gonna say like the <laughs> the Death Cult Assassin's only a 46. Purchase, yes, but I only the only attribute bonus I start with is agil uh, agility, agility four. Yeah, yeah. Everything else is still a baseline one from there. So, so the system's quite good in that respect. But if you really want to go off piste and you want to design your own archetype, you can do with the system as well. You can. There's a element of mix and match in that sense. <coughs> um, so really, it's it's more of a question then of knowing that. Um, what else should we say about the system? Uh, it's a standard attribute plus skill rank, which gives you a value. That value is the number of d6s you roll. Uh, so this is a dice pool system. Uh, you roll your d6s, one of which will be the wrath die, another color die. And any four or more is a success. Any six or more is a double success. So they're called icons and exalted icons. And a six on the wrath die is when you do something really good happens. If you're doing a negotiation, it just goes swimmingly well. Uh, if it's a combat attack, you get to roll on the critical hits table, which is comprehensive and brutal, uh, as expected. You know, limbs go flying off and other things like that. Uh, and then it, it's just that simple. You can do. There's other things we can talk about when we get into the first session, which we can cover. But let's focus. Do you want to on... talk about keywords? Um, yeah, I mean, most characters have a keyword or two, which will say, which will limit what equipment they can buy, which skills they can get. So, like, if you're the keyword is Imperium, you have access to Imperium weapons. If you're an orc, you are not going to have easy access to Imperium weapons because your keyword is orc, uh, much like if you're Eldari. Uh, and then you'll get other keywords that build upon that. So, for example, uh, Crystal, you'll have a keyword which will be Astra Militarum because you're a member of the Astra Militarum. Uh, likewise, uh, David's character has Adeptus Mechanicus and Skitari. So all these keywords just layer up because it just adds it adds flavor. It guides you on what things are what things they can pretty much automatically get access to, and also their keywords that allow you to um, for for more social 
interactions. They guide you on what bonuses. So an orc is going to have trouble talking to someone from the Imperium. Someone from the Imperium from the Astral Militarum is going to have less difficulty talking to someone else from the Imperium who might also just be like an underhive scum. It's that kind of thing. So any other questions or shall we, you know, we can crack on with um, character generation. Right now there's no form fillable character sheet. Uh, that is forthcoming, I am told. Um, so we'll just have to scroll on our character sheets using whatever means or ability we have for that. Or write it down on a sheet of paper and I'll do it for you later, which is also a piece of paper. Excellent. Mechanical pencil. Yeah. Mechanical. So um, who wants to talk about what they're grabbing for their character and um, and how and what things they want to kind of what type of I guess what type of, of talents and uh, skills are kind of aiming for? <coughs> well, is there like so in a system like Vampire the Masquerade, you kind of like you want to pick your attributes, then your skills, then your like it walks you through it. Is there like yes. is a it's adjusted order to choose things in Warhammer? Or... Uh, yes, there is a, there is some suggestions in that. So obviously, certain attributes are what certain skills run off. Okay. So, uh, like your com your weapon skill runs off, I believe, your uh, agility, for example. Uh, your strength will be a bonus in damage on combat attacks. Uh, then the the other thing is that um, certain talents will have prerequisites for for those that will either come from attribute or a skill and also on top of that the way you buy skills means you can't min max okay so you it's called it's what's called the tree of knowledge so say you want to have a skill at rank four you must have uh you must have a number of skills you must have four skills first before that skill can go up to rank four okay so it just means you can't go, I'll have two skills both at rank five and just be done with. It has to be everything else. In other words, you have to have a fleshed out rounded character. Madness. Madness, I know. Oh now, my character. Each, uh, That's not 40k in any way, shape, or form. I want to point out that everybody under archetypes, they also have um, suggested attributes, suggested mm -hmm. yeah. skills, and suggested yeah. talents. So it does, it, does, um, it does fast track us on that as well. Uh, and because also everyone is playing a uh, Adeptus, um, a playing for Imperial characters, we can go to, um, at the, in the, the faction section, so which is uh, Adeptus Ministorum or Adeptus uh, Militarum or Adeptus Mechanicus, there's also some really cool tables you can roll on for the background of your character. So, for example, um, there are things which your character can focus on. So you can say, what's the main thing that defines them? Is it their, the world they're from that defines them, their origin? Or is it their accomplishment that they've achieved so far in their, their life? Or is it their goal? So you can pick one of those tables to roll upon, and that will then give you a bonus to the skill that it gives. Or you can just pick one and narratively just go, I think that fits better. So... Uh, for example, Crystal, on I think it'll be on page uh, 61, we've got a list of which, which Astra Militar and Regiment have you served in? Um, and that will give some more flavour to your character. Like you could have maybe yeah. done all your stuff on, you may have done most of your training days as, as a member of the Talon Desert Raiders, which basically means you're good at understanding mm -hmm. desert world tactics and fighting on, on, war, uh, on war zones like that. Or maybe you're You've, you were trained on Cadia. Uh, you did most of your, your work on Cadia, which is a lost world. And so you faced the very worst of chaos on the battlefield. So there's things like that. So there's a lot of, there's quite a number of tables for character generation that allows you to add some flavor where you were like, where, you know, off the top of your head, it'd be quite hard to come up with, especially for a setting so broad as 40K. Uh, there are some other tables you can roll on as well, which can allow you to work out traits like the color of their eyes, uh, the color of their hair, things like that. So in that case, in that respect, what Cubicle 7 has done is replicated many of the tables that they put in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Because it's there's kind of a, 
let's just say there's there's a slight there's a certain fun in just rolling a very random character and seeing what comes up and trying to play the narrative that emerges. So he wants to he wants to start with with adding some details to their character. It's very quiet. <laughs> well, we've effectively went through the character creation earlier today just to. Okay, well, if you've been through it, then you can go through go for us and explain your character then in more detail. Yeah. So. Um... For pure simplicity, as I went through it, I just I actually went for the the base archetype um, of the guitarist, and that cost me fifty eight. Yeah, fifty eight XP. Okay. Um, so that gives me the base type Skitarius, um keywords Imperium, Adeptus Mechanicus, and Skitari. And I also get to choose the Forge World. Um, now Forge Worlds are worlds owned by the Adeptus Mechanicus, they've been completely turned over to industrialization and building and worshipping the Omnisci, building more Skitari, building the Titan Legions, so these massive, huge, kilometre-high machines of war that um, the Imperial use. Um, they also build a lot of the tanks and things on there, so each one has its own specific design. Um, I did just choose a, a Forge world, but I forgot what it is. I'll come back to that later. Okay. And <laughs> so, uh, yeah. what, so what origin did you go for? Is he uh, Forge-born or Void-born or is he, what's this, Promethean uh, prosthetism? You've been uh, converted, yes. I, I am converted. I am Pro Promethean. Okay, so you so that also gives you a plus one bonus to your conviction. Conviction, <laughs> yeah. So conviction's a stat which is essentially to resist corruption. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've got a massive sheet of paper here writing on it. So that's um, my... yeah, carry on. Um, so you accomplish months of quest for knowledge, forbidden tech, necron assault. Love the idea of Necron Assault, but uh, I think well with these you think... only pick you only pick one you only pick origin or accomplishment or goal Do you? you don't you don't pick all okay, three cool. no no cool um, you do pick an objective though yes an objective so um, I am because I have converted my goal is going to be to give praise to the Omnicide for some small miracle. Um, so I've kind of taken on the religious aspect of the Adeptus Mechanicus here. Um, so it's just kind of, uh, the objectives are you kind of like your story books for your character and kind of some things they'll do every now and then. Um, I think Chris is frozen on me, isn't No, I'm just checking. Actually, they did change it. The, this is a change from first edition. Now that just shows you, like, even writing on a book, you never know until you see the final thing how everything <laughs> syncs up. No, you do get to pick all three. You do get to roll off each one of those um, three tables. So that that's kind of fun. So you get you get an origin, you get an accomplishment, you get a goal, and then you get an objective. So the importance of objective in this game is not only is it a narrative element of your character, if you work towards an objective, it gives you, it rewards you with, with things. So it rewards you in terms of, um, I think it re rewards you in terms of wrath die. So yeah. uh, you get wrath points back, which are just, you know, like willpower points, you get to spend them to do cool things. And there are two pools of points in the game. There are wrath points, which are yours to use, and you start a session with two of them, and it goes up and down as you uh, as you use them to get to do re rolls, or you get uh, you get them back for rolling a six on the wrath die uh, for doing actions or good role play. But then also you've got glory, and glory is a combined pull for all players to use, so you can add dice to your dice pool and so forth. So, and if you you know how I said about if you rolled a six, it counts as uh, an exalted icon. Say you say you needed to be a difficulty two roll, a uh, difficulty two test, yeah, and you rolled uh, enough successes, and you had some excess sixes, some ex excess exalted icons. You can shift those 
not only to do to add to damage in your in your um, if it's a combat attack, you can shift them in non-combat to add some narrative flair to what you're doing, or some extra level of what you were doing. So not only do you do you uh, fix the vehicle, you improve it. Say um, you can also shift and have those icons go to the glory pool, so you can stock up so other people can use them at a later point. So it's quite good. There's kind of like that teamwork play there. You should ideally only use glory points if everyone else at the, in the group say you can. And we will be playing the rule that if you want to use it and no one agrees you should, uh, I get ruin points. Ruin points are like wrath points for the GM to do evil, nasty things. So if you want to be a bastard to everyone, please do so. It'll be hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that was one of the fun rules that, I, that I, I liked in the original edition. It says you're meant to ask, but you don't have to. Yeah. Um, so, 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 David, you're quite good on on that. Um, I, yeah. I'm going to bring up the Adeptus Ministorum, uh, uh, not Adeptus Ministorum, Adeptus uh, Militarum. So, so, Crystal, what kind of yeah. world of battle do you think this? commissar has seen the most and uh regiment they've possibly worked with the most um let's see here um what was the page again that you had said that those uh, were page 61. 61 i like how when i type it in it actually goes to the right page mm. <laughs> all right um the canadian shock troopers sound fun Canadian shock troopers. <laughs> I may have misread that. It's possible I misread that. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to go with the uh, um, uh, Vos Troyan firstborn. Oh, Ooh, yes, Vos Troyan firstborn. Oh, they're cool looking, aren't they? They're the they're ones. The, that, they're the, they're the Russian looking. Ones. Yeah, they basically they they look like um czarist Russia um soldiers. They have big bearskin hats. They have long red trench coats. Uh, uh, they're, they're totally cool. They're totally, totally cool. Um, excellent. Um, every firstborn child of, of Australia is offered to the Astro Militarum in atonement for the planet's past sins. Wow. Um, all see this yep. as an honor, continuing to send reinforcements blind through the void despite the perils of the Noctis Eternia you gain plus rank bonus to leadership tests. So rank is, there are two ways of, um, to explain that. There is tier in the game, and as you get XP, at some point you can go up a tier with your characters. Rank is kind of like a, a fine grading between it. So as you gain enough XP, that can be put into rank, and that gives you bonuses on certain uh, abilities like this, or gives you on talents. So Vestroyan's, yeah, Vestroyan's kind of cool. Uh, and then, we've got your backgrounds. So uh, you've got your origin, which you can roll for, or you can pick if, it, if you think it makes more sense. Uh, we've got recent recruit, or you were born to the regiment, or you've got no choice, that you were tithed without consent. Let's have some fun with this. Let's see here. Since I don't actually have a V3. Um, all right. We are going to do <laughs> advancement for the goal. Oh, right. Uh, origin <laughs> is going to be. Sorry, I'm bouncing around here. That's okay. um, oh, uh, regiment born. Excellent. Okay. And then uh, for we'll accomplishments. Is uh, 15 plus hours. Oh, cool. Okay, right. So here we go. So what this so means. This is what, yep. Yeah, so regiment born uh, means you know your you your parents have been in the Astra Militarum, which makes sense. Um, you it, it's in your core to be a member of the uh, Astra Militarum uh, to the extent that your parents are 
both died on the field of battle and not only did you are you going to be part of the Vestroian? You uh, got sent to the Skull of Pro uh, Progenum on that world, and you're now a Commissar. So that's how you got to that. So you'll get plus one on your influence rating on top of all the XP that you spend on it. Uh, you've also got 15 plus hours, which is you've exceeded the usual life expectancy of a frontline <laughs> trooper despite the horrors of war. You're practically a veteran, um, which means you get <laughs> plus one to your maximum shock. So shock is, um, there are two kind of forms of damage in this game. There's either physical damage or there's mental damage. Shock is kind of like, if your shock gets exceeded, you, you, you're, you're lagging it. If you deal more shock to the enemy, they're going to get pinned. They're going to get. They're going to lose their resolve. And against mobs of troops, you can start killing them off quite quickly. And your your goal, sorry, was the advancement. Yeah, you, you're looking for promotion. Like you're going to kill whoever you want in order to do that, which is great. And then you just need to roll for your objective. So we're already getting a flavour for this character. Um, let's go with Ian um, with your your table which is the yes. adeptus ministorum we've got some interesting things to look at here you um so i am not randomizing um okay. i have a concept i'm working with um, sure. based on how difficult assassins were described to me so i picked um do you want me just to, do you want me to start with the background and then the objective or oh uh, yeah go with the origin accomplishment and goal okay. and then the objective so for origin i'm gonna go with tithe um, okay. which means as a child I was given to the Ecclesiarchy um, charge as part of a family tradition, and I spent my life cloistered without study of the Imperial, Imperial cult. Um, Excellent. For accomplishment, I'm going to go with Crisis of Faith. So um, after my community faced doubt, I rekindled the light of fervor, overcoming a profoundly dark and lonesome trial. And then for my goal, I am on a pilgrimage. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> so I feel driven to undertake a pilgrimage, one that will surely test my faith and help me become one of the blessed. Excellent. That, that's good because there is a, um, there is a ecclesiarchy world uh, in the Gilead sector that is in dire need of pilgrims to go to it to bring back the light of the emperor. Perfect. Uh, and then your objective is... My objective is to emphasize the power of faithful deeds over words. Yeah, faithful deed here is open to interpretation, isn't it? Oh, yes. Mm, I thought <laughs> as much. Excellent. Now, Chig, you're on the same table here for your characters. I oh, know, are you? That's Mr. No. Priest. Oh, you've got an entirely different. Got team. my whole own thing, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so. Um, what are you getting for your origin accomplishment and goal? Let me find that table again. Sorry, I turned away. Page um, 52. 52, yes. Um, let's see. Uh, page 52. Um, so for my background, and I did roll, um, my background, I rolled a three, so I got Blessed Tomes, which gives me a bonus to conviction. Uh, the words of the faithful guided me since I first beheld them. I quote from these texts often, though not always in the way that their original writer intended. So that tells me that uh, I'm all about the uh, creative interpretation of the scriptures. Excellent. And I'm assuming with 40,000 years of scripture behind us, there's, 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 Holy words for basically anything. Uh, yes. Uh, for my accomplishment, uh, I rolled a two. Uh, so I have purged the unclean. I led a kill team <laughs> wow. to wipe out a nest of corruption, though victory did come at a cost. Which, You're the lone survivor then. You know, they gave their lives for the glory of the <laughs> emperor. It's true. Excellent. And they were okay with that, and I'm okay with that. Um, so that increases my maximum wounds. And for my goal, wow. uh, uh, I would like to reclaim a relic. Long ago, uh -oh. an important Ministorum relic went missing. I would do anything to recover this relic and restore it to the Ecclesiarchy. Excellent. I forgot to mention, I get, um, sorry, uh, plus one conviction, plus one resolve, and plus one max shock from cool. the background by 
Uh, that last one gives me a plus one to determination. Excellent. And as for my objectives, uh, I rolled a four, so I want to fill my lungs with a bolstering hymn in a time of stress. Wow. Okay. And um, so, yeah, these are all these are all bonuses on top of what you um, you build as your your character. So. Um, you, you add those on once you've done everything else because otherwise they'll cost you extra XP on well, the way the, the the way stats are bought using XP if you took these at, at, as standard at, before you do that it means you'll be, be charged more for things right you get a tax on that yeah there's a, there's a tax because it's a it's a curve anyway cool and then Mike has mostly got a, a few things that he's mostly rolling up but uh, I'm sure he will inform us in due course on that one. So we've, so we've got archetypes. We know something about the background of these characters. Uh, there are buying attributes then. There's a nice table that shows you what its increment costs and its XP costs is. That's on page 24 uh, for people following along at home maybe. Uh, there's some species maximums for attributes. So like a human can't be greater than strength eight, whereas an orc can be strength 12 because that's insane. And that's about the same as a Primaris space marine. Uh, there's also a table for skill costs, though at this point, warning, do not pay attention to the total XP cost on skills, only use the incremental XP cost, that's got to be fixed in the uh, errata before the book goes to print in a month's time, no. uh, it's a known problem. Um, so, you know, I think it's fairly easy to work through that, uh, because everyone's human, there's uh, you can work out what your base speed and, and everything else is with that. We've done the backgrounds uh, a little early, but that's fine. Can you cover very briefly, like, what would an average what does an average agility be? Like, what would average Ooh, be for you? Okay, human? so um, human average is like two on things. Uh, most of you guys are more than likely going to be hitting threes or slightly higher than that um on depending upon how you you know specialize on mm -hmm. on certain things uh depending upon whether you want to be good in close combat or good in um good in at shooting or good at say leadership or psychic abilities or technology and so forth huh. um is there anything else i can explain that will be useful that people can understand um language wise is important everyone speaks the lang same language most of you will speak all no standard uh, low Gothic, which is essentially like speaking German. Kind of Germanic mixed with uh, elements of Old English uh, and various other bits of language mixed in, because you've got to think that over the thousands upon thousands of years, you know, society rises and falls. And so you kind of get this idea of a very Baroque, um, decaying society that has that type of language whereas high gothic <laughs> is essentially Latin-ish. You may as well assume it's Latin. Uh, the, those of you that will know that high gothic really well to read it will be Ian. You know your, your death cult satin who is you can explain what they're mostly how they dress later because they, they're kind of weird <laughs> weird looking. Um, skulls everywhere but yeah you understand high gothic yeah. uh, Crystal your character will understand high gothic to a point uh, maybe not to the high, to the level that you can read some of the more um, involved scriptures. Uh, uh, same with Chig, you will know High Gothic because, of course, you've had that kind of training for your sister of battle. Whereas, like David's no. character, apparently, um, I do know High Gothic. I only know High Gothic and the computer language which they speak. I don't. Uh, know yes, Cant Mechanicus. Yeah, <laughs> which is basically like talking in Fortran, I think. Yeah, this is kind of where my name in the whole thing is. This is going to go. There's going to be a lot of dodgy, dodgy computer. Da jokes. David's character is also very good at doing punch cards, but into computers. Yeah, yeah. I spit them out of my mouth. That's how I talk. Like, yeah. Uh, whereas Mike's character will know some really, really uh, uncouth kind of low gothic, and you know, he speaks. He speaks. You understand what he's saying, but he just says it in a way you're just like. <laughs> really it's it's worse than the kind of comparisons that are made between londoners and people from the north of england it's that level of, of but worse 
Uh, Cheeky, we're saying your character was Northern as well. I surely understand High Gothic as part of their uh, training. Oh no, I, I was I was incorrect. I didn't realize that Adeptus Ministorum was uh, one of my keywords. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a whole chart about this on uh, on thirty on page thirty one of the rule yeah, book. Yeah, it's it's so glossy is in there. So uh, as a as a caveat, so glossy is like a, a code language used by certain inquisitors. It's a catch-all term. The term glossy is actually the personal coded language of Inquisitor Eisenhorn from the Eisenhorn trilogy. But just assume that. It's a good catch-all term to get the idea that inquisitors use coded languages because they're paranoid, so paranoid. Um, whereas orcs, orcs speak something that you can vaguely understand, but it's like listening to football hooligans, completely drunk all the time. Um, whereas Eldari is... Ooh, a complex uh, flowing language augmented with gestures, poses, and references to culture. Yeah. In context dependent runes, the Eldari lexicon is almost impenetrable to outsiders. Uh, Tamar and Jalad, isn't it? I think it's that kind of. Uh... <laughs> it, it's like, you know, text to uh, emojis just in people form. Yeah. Okay, so looking at character creation processes so far that we've gone through. So we've done we've done background early because it was the most that gives flavor that everyone's most really more interested in at this stage. Uh, we've already got a framework, which is you are um, you know members of Lord Varenius's uh, fleet. I think there's maybe some bonuses on that as well. We'll get to later. Uh, as we said, competency is you know three or four. It's really considered very good at a skill. Um, at a low level for regular humans. Two is, you know, uh, a, a very green Imperial Guardsman. Uh, you've got, so the next stage is spending XP on uh, your character, going through attributes, then skills, and then talents. Um, and, and being aware of the time, kind of what kind of talents and things do you want to be capable of? And then, you know, I think that's what's more informative for this is knowing what you want to be capable of because then for the homework, you can cook up the character. We can get the character sheets up onto the Dark Days Radio blog so people can see what these characters are yep. and see what the process is. So what do people want to be capable of doing with, with, with talents and so forth? Miracles. Miracles. <laughs> the, hey, the Sister of Battle <laughs> gets access to um, to faith talents, and I would be a fool not to take at least Shield of Faith. Yes. Shield of Faith sounds super good, super useful. So um, let's go to the list of talents. I am bringing up my page here now. Uh, where are we? It's got to be that one. Shield of Faith uh, is on page 144 of the core book. Uh, yep. As long as I have a willpower of three or higher, I'm a human from the Imperium. Uh, I get uh, plus one faith. Faith is how you power faith uh, abilities. Uh, as a reflexive action, I can spend one faith to ignore a psychic power or effect until the end of the round. I may spend well, an additional faith to grant the same bonus to all allies within with the Imperium keyword within 15 plus double rank meters. So wow. if we... If we are attacked by some gross psychic monstrosity, uh, my faith will protect us. Cool. That's wicked. Um, and Chig brings up a good point about, um, he talk, you, you explained it's a reflexive action. So within the game context, when we start doing anything that involves combat, uh, the action uh, uh, economy is you get a move, you get a reflexive action, you get combat action, and you get a basic action to do something else. So in other words, in a turn, you should be able to move, reload your gun, shoot it, and maybe flick the switch on something, for example. And depending upon what you want to do, you'll have less and more of these actions because, of course, you might be running. And if you're running, you're not going to have your actions. The only thing you're going to be able to do is shoot. If you've got a wonderful weapon, though, like, say, a weapon that has the assault keyword, you can run and shoot with it and shoot again because your running is also, as a, as a move-action combination, it's kind of more like tactical movement, like you're running forward and just randomly firing before getting off a good solid shot on someone. So there's a lot of things in there. So, and as Chick said, you're taking, you're, you're taking acts of faith because it's pretty cool to be able to pull those off. 
Um, that's that's really neat. What are the suggested talents, um, Crystal, for your um, commissar? Do we do you have that list in front of you? I or? do. Just give me one second. I've got a list of the talents in front of me. All right. Yes, I have a list. So, suggested talent um, uh, talents would be augmentic, fearless, okay. tenacious, and stoic. Okay, so augmentic means you, something's happened pretty bad on the battlefield and you now have a cybernetic implant somewhere in your body. You might have, uh, and an augmentic is not quite the same as a full bionic. So it's like saying you got shot and part of your lungs had to be replaced or something like that. So it costs like 20 XP plus the value of the augmentic. So it's not a huge amount, but it's, it's not like having your entire arm replaced or or something like that. So that's kind of fun. That says something about your character that they've survived the field of battle. Maybe. Uh, what was the next one? Fearless. Fear. Well, that 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 says it all. Um, <laughs> you're fearless. Um, what more can we say? You automatically pass any fear check. Uh, you're. You need to have at least willpower rating four for this, uh, and you're immune to interaction attacks uh, made using intimidation. So. That brings up another part of the game system. Uh, not only can you do combat actions, you can do things that are called interaction attacks. Like you could uh, proclaim the glories of the emperor to to make the um, to make the enemy cow before you. Or an interaction attack, as this do does, means you know someone might be trying to do intimidation. And Crystal, as a commissar, you're just like, no, I believe in the god emperor of mankind, and you're going to die for your for your sins, you evil Xenos heretic. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's 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 kind of fun. What was the next one? Tenacious. Ah, well, that that's again <laughs> that, that says that says it all. Um, which is you recover shock every time you roll an exalted icon when you roll determination. So in other words, you don't run away from a from the battlefield very easily. Uh, so that's that's very very nice. And was there one last one? Stoic. Stoic which will be there, which is, um, oh, interesting, they didn't list Tenacious and Stoic in, was it listed alphabetical order on there? I'm just uh, knowing for- No, it's not, they flipped it. Uh, I'm just thinking for, for Arata. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to start singing the alphabet in my head real yeah. quick. <laughs> so, um, Stoic means uh, through a quirk of biology, um, you face no longer, uh, your face no longer betrays emotion. <laughs> oh, you're like, you're like Gregor Eisenhorn from the Eisenhorn trilogy. Basically, people get your rank times two as a penalty to find out uh, to do insight tests. So, in other words, to read your emotions or read what you're thinking, whether you're going to pull a gun on someone. No one, you, you are the perfect poker player. It's kind of that's kind of fun. Um, nice. There are some other fun ones which might fit your character as well, which I, I'm going to pick out because it's a rather new one that I like. It wasn't in first edition. Um, gallows humor is basically you find humor in the darkest of places and use it to bolster the resolve of your allies, which basically means you can spend a simple action to make some grim joke whenever you are wounded or suffer a condition. You make a fellowship att uh, attribute test and you and your allies uh, can hear you, you recover shock equal to your equal to your rank bonus plus number of number of icons. So in other words, you make horrific jokes about how awful the galaxy is and you bolster everyone's <laughs> resolve. That's that's really, really fun. And I've also in doing this spotted a small typo that I'm gonna put through to the team. <laughs> oh, this is great. This is how we should be doing. This is community driven. Get the typos out before it go, goes to print, goes to press. Um, so yeah, there's a lot in there that you can do. Um, uh, let's talk about the let's talk about this death cult assassin because I'm sure there's going to be some wonderful talents they've got acts that are suggested. <laughs> there are, uh, yeah. So the suge I, I've I've actually been sitting here typing up a list of all the ones that look really cool to me, and I obviously right. will not be able to buy all of them on character creation, but I hope to eventually pick up maybe one or two of them. Um, so the suggested ones are blood must flow. <laughs> eliminator flagellant silent right so blood must flow is uh, essentially you can deal the bleeding condition much more easily yep. to target which That's... yes 
hundred percent. That's that's hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> Already um, wrote it down. What's, what's the what's the next one? Uh, the next one is eliminator. Oh, stealth attacks. Yes, basically. Sneak, yeah, yeah, sneak cool. attack style. Okay, it's, and yeah. Uh, silent, which kind of pairs with that. Um, that lets me. I, I believe that just lets me move at full speed and still yes. maintain stealth, which is super useful. And then the last one on the suggested list, which I will caveat with, I'm not taking is flatulence. Oh, that's a good one. It is a good one, <laughs> and it fits. But I want to take something else instead. <laughs> Let's just read this because this is yes. this is how wonderfully hilarious it is. Um, you're dedicated to the to the you dedicate your pain to the service of the emperor. This is anyone with the Imperium keyword note. So Crystal could take this, for example. Chick could take this. Um, at the start of each day, you must spend 20 minutes Terran standard in prayer and inflict wounds upon your uh, upon e no, inflict wounds to yourself equal to your tear through self-flagellation. Um, so you are literally taking losing wounds off your stats there each day automatically. You may not roll determination when uh, these wounds are suffered or allow them to be healed by any methods other than through respite. Um, as long as you are wounded in this way, you gain your rank bonus dice to your determination and conviction rolls and may choose to become frenzied as a combat action. Uh, if, you, if you also have the frenzy talent, you may become frenzied as a simple action. So in other words, you get to attack, yep. you get to do even more attacks. Wow, yep. that's just insane. Um, if you fail to flagellate yourself, you, you're overcome by shame and gain plus two difficulty uh, uh, number to uh, penalty to Tessa until you flagellate yourself. That's absolutely hilarious, though. It's a fantastic. It is a fantastic talent. Um, the the only reason I'm not taking it on character creation, I may pick it up later, is because yeah. I really want to take dual wield. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you could always learn flagellate at a later point. You may become exactly. so intoxicated with the God Emperor that you go, "I really, really need to spend my day flogging myself." Just need to start peeling some skin <laughs> off every day, every morning. It's fine. Wow. <laughs> That's 40k for you. That's 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 really don't really worry. If people weren't you. worried about this going dark, I will make sure it happens. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm gonna just if this isn't aware to people, yes, I may have written for this book, but no, this this stream is not endorsed or official from Cubicle Seven or GW. So um, anything you hear, say, or do is not representative of that. So. When this gets dark, it will go dark. I'm sure when an official stream is done, we will we will try and make it dark, but palatable dark. <laughs> this, this, is, this stream is, however, obviously uh, sponsored by Gehenna Gaming, and <laughs> all of our content is rated R. Oh, yes. And oh, so good. is Dark. And so is Dark yeah. Radio and Dark Hammer. So, hey. Um, well, I can talk about my wonderful... Yeah, what talents are you kind of going for, David? All right, well, the, the, the suggested ones, are, um, obviously, are augmentic, because... Of course. There's two which are effectively kind of the same thing, binary chatter and conversational cogitator. It's kind okay. of to talk to machines. Um, the conversational cogitator allows me to use my tech skill instead of my fellowship, I think, when I'm talking to people, because I don't do people. Uh, the, the one that really interested me was, especially when I'm kind of going down more religious Omnisire worship route, is the right of magnometrics. Okay. It allows me to move objects, metal objects, with my hand at a distance, or pull, oh. float, and basically become a big magnet. So you've got some built-in electromagnetic augmetics to your body yeah. and you can float things around yeah and cool. pull weapons cool. off people during combat that's oh. that's pretty neat yeah the other one which i've just i've just gone through the list the other one which i thought would be quite amusing would be deficiency okay through otherworldly discipline or surgical treatments you have rendered immune you are you've been rendered immune to temptations of the flesh um, I actually almost said I was wanted to take that. Yeah, which is the fact that I'm surprised that's not one of the suggested skills, uh, talents, to be honest, for the Admech because they don't have a body. Um, it gives me plus double rank to my conviction and resolve, but I may no longer add tier to my shock. Right. Hmm. Um, but it's kind of, yeah, I, I, I've 
changed my body up. So what, excellent. Uh, what page is that well on? Uh, 136. 136. All humans can take it. <laughs> but I also like the idea of being a floating magnet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chick, what, your, what kind of talents are you aiming for? You said uh, Acts of Faith. Were there any other talents you were thinking of? Um, orthoproxy. That oh, one sounded shit. fun. <laughs> uh, I am flipping through orthopro uh, orthopraxy. The litanies of his holy word have burned themselves deep in your memory. You can recite hymns and prayers to the emperor by rote. Uh, and this basically means as a simple action, you can begin, you can be begin mentally recounting ecclesiastical liturgies. Whilst you are doing this, you gain plus one bonus willpower uh, for rank turns. Uh, you can't use this talent again until you can complete a respite. So respite is just you know downtime between combat uh, combat scenes. It's the um, rest. That is it's a rest power. action. Yeah. So yeah, you you just say hymns to yourself in your head, and you it inspires you to resist things because it gives you bonus to your willpower. It's yeah, super cute cool. that you think I'm going to keep them in my head. <laughs> yeah, you're going to say <laughs> right. <laughs> The great thing is, the great thing is with the 40k universe, there's there's plenty of um, plenty of written in setting material that I'm sure, Jake, you can if you took that, you could find a small hymn uh, to the emperor that you can recite whenever you want in game. Is that right? Oh, absolutely, 100% oh, yeah. what I plan on doing, and I'm going to be super <laughs> annoying about it. Sorry, guys. So, have we just so found you're the playing 40k as... version of a bard? Yeah, you're yes. a space bard. Yeah. <laughs> space bard nun in power armor with a bolt pistol and chain sword uh no less yeah don't forget mm, nice. yeah um wow uh and then obviously mike is still afk due to technical issues um but we can at least say what some of the suggested talents are for scabby can't we if someone goes to the scabby page for me and then i'll go through the talents that we've got here is it scabby or scum? Scavy is under scum. They're kind of scummy, you know. We don't <laughs> like to judge. It's a tier two scum. It's on page 105. Uh, the suggested Ooh. talents are Dirty Fighter, which I read and sounded super fun. Uh, Hive Explorer. Silent, which we've covered before. And Unremarkable, which for, you know, mutants is kind of... Kind of an interesting one to take. Yeah, so so Dirty Fighter is exactly that. Um, whenever you make an interaction attack, uh, you can shift two exalted icons. Uh, well, if you make an interaction attack and shift two exalted icons, you can inflict your target with an additional condition. So uh, essentially, this is kind of like going, I'm going to do an interaction attack to chuck sand in your face. So it causes them to be blinded. And also, if you do it really well, they go prone because they, they trip over. So I could say that's kind of that's that's what you can do with it. Um, what was the other one? Hive Explorer is, a, is one that I actually I think I actually I, I'm the one that suggested it should exist in the game, um, which basically means you're very good at moving through the underhive. Um, I think I really think Mike should take that. Um, that's if Mike's there, if he's listening in the void um, on on the astropath that's fine and then there was unremarkable really yeah. really um you are forgettable and blend into crowds easily yeah he's definitely right he, you heard it here first he's not taking that he's so not allowed that. so <laughs> so here's 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 how that works if you're a, a freaky goat man mutant um it says that characters of a higher social class with the imperium keyword keyword uh ignore you yeah so he is too far beneath their notice. That's how he's unremarkable. Not that he's, you know, not a freakish goat man, but that he is such a freakish goat man that they can't look down their long noses. He's, at. he's basically learned how to not stand out in a crowd when the crowd is wearing, you know, ermine trimmed, you know, robes and glorious golden armor and drinking amasak from from some world you know from a world that's like you know 400 light years away uh yeah that's 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 perfectly viable then that's that's kind of cool but if you uh if you um 
couple of the mechanical aspects of that where anyone attempting to notice or track you in a crowded area or trying to remember your face has a higher difficulty. If you pair that with uh, the Underhive uh, Explorer that you mentioned a minute ago, yeah. it really works out really well. Oh, because you get your rank bonus on stealth in that. Yeah, so or survival. You, so in other words, he can roll a really high stealth rating for the for a scene, but then also he's very hard to detect once that's established. Yeah, they that's, have to roll even harder <laughs> yeah, to, to right. find him. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, I'm sure Mike will get back on what his choices are for that. So, I mean, many of these, as we said, they've got an XP cost that's associated with them. Uh, so very, not all of them, they have either uh, a rank requirement or a skill requirement and of course also requirements in the keywords that we've explained uh where are we up to next in things we should possibly talk about in our last few minutes is there anything else we want to Maybe chat about? archetype abilities okay yeah that's a good thing let's, the go, actual... let's go through everyone's archetype abilities and that would i think that then finishes up and gives us some flavor so, um, David, what's your archetype ability as a Skitari? It is, uh, gone off the page now, um, it's basically me being really, really heavily augmented. Um, so, yeah, actually it is heavily augmented. So, your body has been redesigned to withstand the rigours of war, you do not bleed. Um, so, I'm immune to bleeding, and I gain plus rank bonus dice to determination roll. Okay, so determination yes, is what you you use to soak wounds, essentially. Uh, if you soak wounds, it turns it into shock. So it's kind of like, oh, I, rather than, it, think of it as in, you take, you're, you're taking very um, superfluous, kind of like superficial flesh wounds, but obviously that's going to, uh, that's going to impact your willingness to fight on as you're pinned by gunfire or, or whatever. Okay, cool. Um, Chig, your sister of battle has purity of faith. That's kind of fun. You and any allies within 15 meters gain plus double your rank bonus dice to corruption tests. So in other words, you help everyone resist corruption due to chaos and, and so forth. You gain plus double rank bonus dice to any test to resist the effects of a psychic power. Wow, you are awesome at stopping psychers and chaos. Yeah, so please throw some psychers and or chaos at us. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ian's uh, Death Cult Assassin has Glancing Blow. Oh, yeah. You depend upon your swift movement and honed reflexes to avoid harm. You may use your agility instead of your toughness when you roll determination. That's awesome. And you may roll determination against mortal wounds. Wow. You normally can't do that. Um, you cannot use this ability if you're immobilized in some way, uh, such as through the restrained condition. So, mm -hmm. in other words, you, 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 you slip and slide past attacks. Yep. Wow, that's that's wicked. That's pretty damn good. Uh, Mike's is a scabby. He's a mutant. Your life is in the unsanitary underbelly of the Imperium. It's mutated you. Select two mutations from the list of scabby mutations. Whenever your rank increases, you may select another mutation. That's nice. excellent. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if we reach rank, uh, if, if he increases his rank, then he gets a new mutation. Uh, that's going to be awesome. I hope he does pick extra mutations with that um and then who else we've got we've got tech priest we've got imperial commissar fearsome respect you and any allies within 15 meters of you uh that you can see you may add double may add double rank bonus die to resolve tests you add your double rank bonus uh in dice to any intimidation tests uh including interaction tests so basically as long as people can see you and see that you're fighting, they'll fight on, and you can berate and intimidate people really, really, really well. So you might need that. My resolve is crap. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. So everyone is everyone is um, essentially quite horrific in their own special little way, um, and the Imperium is the Imperium and the the universe is a horrible place. So I think that all fits. Uh, rather well. Uh, is there anything else we should just finish up with? Yes. Yes. Um, I think that we should go over safety mechanics that we're going to use. Yeah. 
yes, that is a very good point in all of this. Yes. Um, what would be your suggestions, Crystal, given that what we know of the setting and what we what we mostly consider to be the baseline kind of uh, story content of the game? Um, I think X card would work best for me with all of this. Yeah. I'm quite happy with X card and uh, I think I'm, I'm even happy with um, like or uh, we can X card things. I'm also happy with people because uh, with doing a yeah it's okay on on bits or going yep. eh, if you know you're thinking that scene has gone way too darker than even I was considering in the context of 40k and there are bits of 40k which I'm sure David you will admit as well there are parts of 40k where we're just like really 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 is that not did you need to do that mm. yeah <laughs> but but you know like that's that character yeah um yeah. So yeah, I'm okay with the, the check-in system too. That's I, I like check-in system because it's um, visual and we can see it very quickly. While we're all here and it is the session zero, it, can we quickly talk about people's level of comfort with vivid descriptions of bodily harm? Because that will yeah. come up with my character. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a very big part of the 40k universe as well. It is body horror, a lot yeah. of this. Um, I think the safe thing is to say in this is that I will anything that involve let's just say anything involving anything horrific to do with Slanesh will be insinuated but never described at all. Things horrible like that yeah. will be you know you don't need to describe it is off screen elsewhere. Yep. Um, we know what Slanesh is. Uh, we're quite happy. If anyone wants to find out about Slanesh, there is plenty of content online. You can read about that dark god. Um, I think that's the best thing to deal with that. So that covers sexual horror and sexual content in that. Uh, mostly the same can be said with romance and so forth, because I don't think that romance is not a theme within 40k. I just think um, you know, it's always awkward with friends you know, uh, to go through that kind of thing. Uh, I think we can obviously be happy that you understand what's going on between the characters and it happens off screen uh, and can be narrated as a in a you know we understand the in a kind of the flow the the romance blooms dot 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 you know fate of flayed black that's all we need (laughs) Uh, unless it's something like you know i don't mind romance and if it's with a npc um it doesn't quite have to fade to black if you do want to describe what the romance the romance is developing if it's socially bright but again sexual content like that fate black happens elsewhere if it's you trying to romance like the daughter of some lord governor of some world and it's important that you've got her hand in marriage that's kind of cool or or man or boy or whatever's going on you know so 40k universe still- is gender is very gender fluid in certain places in the 40k universe and uh, and and sexually fluid in, in other respects. So, you know, that's that's cool, like that kind of romance. I just think between us as players, uh, that can always feel really awkward. It's awkward at a home game as well, anyway, at times. Um, but yeah, gore. Um, I mean, um, I think... Does Mike, not bother me. Yeah, Mike yeah. brought this up as well. Uh, you know, Gehenna Gaming uses a consent form, which we distribute for mm-hmm. uh covers every possible topic um you can we will distribute it so everyone here can fill it out and we can chris will have access to that yep. and can say okay hey ian you're being a little vivid right now let's <laughs> not talk about how you're flaying this person's skin off their body and yeah fade to black and say okay you now are wearing their face we're cool with that <laughs> yeah uh i think that's totally right we can Fade to black or, or red is mostly the right term, uh, as red mist uh, descends on a character or two or three. Um, <laughs> but there's a point, yeah, where the initial description might be enough that, again, us as players and viewers will, they get the point. You know, we don't need to know how every single bolt gun shell is exploding in that horde of cultists. We get they're being mowed down. There, I, you know, it, and also, it takes up a lot of time. There's more story to get through, right? I don't, I, right. I don't need to be like Tolkien mm. describing a field where the field is people being mown down, right? So, 
yeah, I think that that's that's perfectly fine. Um, other points we want to bring. So yeah, it, let's let's also for viewers, you know. 40k has a baseline of violence uh, because it is the grim far future where there is only war. Yep. Um, so, so consider this splatterpunk in its in its format. I think yeah. is the best kind of horror to explain. Um, there may well be some sort of psychological horror at some point uh, as the content veers towards that, or Definitely. alien body horror is also potential. But again, uh, I think the check-in system or X carding where we we get it we get yep. your infecting this person we get the thing is bursting out of them we've all seen those other genre films we get it um we get he's pulling his eyes out we've all watched event horizon or such so um yeah well i think the whole point is we can infer a lot and filling blanks I think, but again, as long as everyone's having fun with the fact of the insanity of the description, because again, 40k is also quite, mm-hmm. you know, play it with some of the dark humour, play it with some of the satire, uh, because that is part of the DNA of the game and of the setting. Um, Very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of a content warning, um, which we can kind of cover at the beginning of the episode as well, body horror, splatter punk, some psychological horror... I, th- I think that covers most of it. Ecclesiastical <laughs> religious horror. Religious context. Religious heavy, horror, religious yeah. Content, heavy religious, religious content. content, yeah. Um, because it does it does border on mm-hmm. roots. Self-flagellation. Yep. And um, I mean, also, we, we have to be aware of that due to the satirical nature of, of the origins of the game and what the Imperium is. Uh, while the characters, the, while many of the characters may hold different political leanings within the setting or different religious leanings within the setting, um, we we are fully aware that they are not um, what we would call morally good characters. They are morally, potentially morally right within the context of the horrible, uh, soul destroying yeah. war they're up against against beings which, you. Know, the, your characters will be doing bad things within the context that if they didn't do that, you know, an entire planet will have all of the, all of its people killed, their souls devoured, and tortured for a billion years upon a billion more. Right. Uh, so you putting a bullet through someone's head and saying "die Zen or scum" is the unfortunate nature of the war that it is and so we can reflect upon that as kind of almost a passion play in that sense that you know we have to we can reflect on the fact that these characters are heroes in their context there's there's some heavy satire involved here Mm -hmm. with regard to yes xenophobia even oh definitely um i think that also ties into something that uh myself mike and eleanor spoke about a lot with regard to mutation within the setting so obviously yes mutation is looked down upon uh but the thing is is that whereas like um whereas within our own within the real world you know unfortunate you know that's purely biology, biology doing unfortunate things because the nature of biology within the 40k universe generally the mutations we're talking about are due to external factors corrupting people at at the level of their soul. So Mike's character has been corrupted to a degree at his very soul. So that is why the Imperium, that is why the Eldari have that view of corruption and mutation. That's why, because it is a very physical manifestation of the very forces they're trying to defeat um yeah it's but again that that goes back to the satire that goes back to the very origins of warhammer and the satire it was saying it has its roots in in thatcherism it has its roots in discussions of how we treated people back in the early days when uh the uh, aids virus was how we treated people that were suffering from that that they were untouchable but it's you know that's obviously we know better. Unfortunately, the Imperium doesn't have time to know better because it's literally one minute to midnight kind of scenario. Um, other points to bring up. Uh, the, the one thing we didn't touch on, and uh, David, your character plays heavily on this. Yeah. There's a heavy transhumanist uh, yes. element as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Also yeah. Seems just... satirically, but it's more of a positive spin on it, it seems. Well, positive in 
Warhammer does. <laughs> we don't hate yeah. you. We hate Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Yeah, it, it's kind of it, they. It is very transhumanist. It is, but it's there is also a race within the 40k universe who have taken that even further than the the ad, ad, they're just mechanics. They're called the Necrons, and they have gone for the really robotic. Um, so I will be taking this with computer humor. Hmm. So it will. It, I will try to not bring in any kind of stuff that could cause issues and just a sarcastic computer with a gun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Paranoid android, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. He's found, he's found God, apparently, as well. Found God and the flesh is weak. That's essentially your the the, the humour of um, the Adeptus Mechanicus. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, oh, is there anything else to bring up? I mean, uh, I mean, setting wise, you know, we'll get in, we'll get into as the game progresses. But again, there'll be a lot of things to do with there'll be a lot of people who are socially economically essentially slaves and serfs because the the imperium is a feudal system so uh again that is part of the the unfortunate like satire is you know for the universe for humanity to survive it has to do the worst things to its own people because it's almost the idea that idle hands do, do the devil's work. Because if you're not making people work to the bone doing something, they have the chance. They have the chance then to go off and like start googling. I say googling, but you know, on their data slate, we'll start <laughs> reading uh, prescribed text, which allows them to then start dabbling in other dark arts, and then essentially becoming a gateway to the very chaos gods. So that's kind yeah. of where the kind of thought process. Of this comes from i think that just says a lot about 40k is based in like medieval uh the 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 ways you know people thought about things back in medieval times back in the reformation you see the the reformation uh with uh within the uk is mirrored in the imperium they had a time when the ecclesiarchy was all like gold everywhere this is great and now it's a pauper's church is what it's meant to be um mm. so they've had that kind of thing so again we'll you know these things will put, turn up Okay. Uh, is there anything else? But yeah, uh, as Mike said, he's, we can also um, we can also just do with our character sheets. We can fill out the um, Gehenna Gaming Consent form just yeah. so people can see how that is filled out yep. for us. I mean, we can mostly collectively fill it out and go, yeah, that's okay. That's not. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, to, to, for those who aren't familiar with it, it covers literally every topic we could mm -hmm. possibly think of that may appear in a horror game. And more or less half of it is never used because we're like, no, we're not going to touch on those themes. We would never touch on those themes. But just in case, we need to be aware. Yeah. Make but everyone yeah. feel safe and comfortable at the table. Yeah, but I, I think there's enough. I mean, fortunately, I think there's enough with 40K that if you know it quite well, I think, or you know, once you, you get it explained to you, the baseline of it is quite obvious. And as I've said to some parents I've met at... Um, at you, uh, uh, Dragon Meat. You, if you want to play this with with kids, you can tune that dial to be very kid friendly, where you're just playing. It's purely heroism within the dark future, and that's totally playable. And there are Games Workshop novels exactly like that for kids. Yeah. So you can then actually really get into the satire of it, where the where the, the you you could have you know sixteen year olds, fifteen year olds playing this, and they are actual heroes, whereas we're certainly not having a team of heroes. You're all horrible. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. We were all well aware uh, we are playing terrible people. Speak yeah. for yourself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you. I am perfect in every way. I mean, you can be a You're hero all heretical. in your own head, right? Yeah. I mean, You're all like... heretical. You're not liking robot form. Screw you all. <laughs> <laughs> Come here a second. I want to see if I can wear your face. <laughs> I'll just take it off and give it to you. you. <laughs> it detaches, it's got hinges. Uh, oh, that got magnetic up. clips. That's an upgrade I want to think about then. Hmm. Oh my gosh, if you get angry at him, you could just take his face. Hide it. <laughs> just walk around wearing it. <laughs> oh. Right. I Perfect. think we are we pretty much done then? I think we are. I, I hope yeah. people yeah. in the comments have enjoyed this kind of 
you know broad slice of the mm -hmm. setting we've been very imperium heavy uh, yep. we will be for quite some time with uh this campaign uh why don't we uh two things quickly uh where can people find out more information about both warhammer 40k and wrath and glory and right. where can people find out more information about each of us right okay so uh the best place to get more information about wrath and glory currently is on the cubicle 7 website i can't remember their url off the top of my head but just look up cubicle 7 and you will find cubicle 7 games.com there we go uh and obviously if you really want to start deep diving into things uh the best place to find out more stuff is go to warhammer community so that's uh warhammer-community.com uh there is plenty there you can search through uh, you can find the really humorous posts, which I think are the up Imperial Uplifting Primer posts, which are literally like, know your enemy and stuff like that. So Crystal, you should read those posts. They're very informative. They're, Ooh, they're really good. Yes. Uh, in the wrong way, they're informative. Um, Send me a link. I will do. Um, and then if you want to get uh, some quick insight into quite a few things that we've covered today. Uh, you can listen to Darker Days Radio episodes of Dark Hammer. So go over to darker-days.org and then look for our episodes Dark Hammer and some of those will be 40K uh, deep dives or broad slices. Uh, the most recent one covered the world of Necromunda, which is kind of relevant for some of the stuff we'll be covering. Uh, then, of course, there is Darker Days Radio, which you can go to our blog, you can go to our Twitter and Instagram, especially the blog and Instagram, because there'll be some miniatures painted up, so we can give you some like visual cues on what we're kind of playing. Mm -hmm. um, I really need to buy some Sisters of Battle to paint now, I think. Thanks, Chick. I need to buy some Sisters of Battle. Um, you know, I'm here for you. <laughs> uh, and, then, um, and then, David, you've got your own painting Yep. Instagram, which is Rising Sun Painting Studio. That's my face. The Facebook is Rising Sun Painting Studio. Yeah. My Instagram is Hagel Daz, which is H A yeah, yeah, yeah. D A Z D A G Z. Yeah. I can never remember this A E or E L. It'll be linked somewhere. But um, yeah, so, yeah. so David's done some like custom builds of models that also fit the 40k aesthetic. A lot of the miniatures painted there. Uh, and then personally, I mean, I've got Patreon, so people please back the Patreon because that goes towards doing some cool extra <coughs> stuff for this. Because remember, 40, all the Darker Days radio content and Dark Hammer is free, but to do other stuff and to keep other things working in the background, pay for things because then you can do more cool stuff like producing more content on storytellers fault and crystal you've got cool links you're on a certain panda themed website do you not have <laughs> yes the geekypanda.com is my website and i actually have to update it to include all of the links for everything for darker days and gehenna gaming now because we're going to be doing stuff together which is yes. awesome um and you can also find me on twitter and facebook and instagram at body and soul 152 yes excellent and then of course ian they can find everything we're pretty much right here and th yeah. there's a bunch of links below <laughs> this video on your twitch stream right now if you're watching yeah. this after the fact over on youtube you probably also have all those links already but gehenna gaming.com gehenna gaming on all the social media platforms you can find me online at ravnos because that's who i am and we also have a patreon which helps support this channel yes yeah. and i think that is it that is everything for now so hopefully all things go to plan uh when do we want to reconvene how i how frequently because that's a question we'll, we'll sort out how frequently because we have busy lives with other things mm. but we will then get started in the dark tides campaign and we'll go through the first couple of you know scenarios stories for that and then after that we kind of into terra incognito and i'll mostly be doing some work to work out where the plot takes us but i think that will be inspired by what inspires you and what interests you and what horrible horrible people you may have annoyed or become or become <laughs> yes uh, one thing we should also know is that um, people can potentially expect to see some guest players show up yeah we um, will ooh. endeavor to get uh people switched in and out so uh, with availability, because it'd be cool for uh, guests of whatever form. It might be someone from Cubicle 7, if I can, can wrangle them. Uh, it might be, let's just say we have contacts. I mean, 
I'm not going to say we can't get Andy Chambers to play, but you never know. We could get Andy <laughs> Chambers to play. And we'll see what just, we can just do. Keep, just keep bugging him every, every day. I'm sure he'll do it. But, I'm but. Sure he'll do it. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see who we can get in as a guest character, because I think that's the great thing of the party setup that we have and a ship that is literally a mile long. There's a number of characters in there, I'm sure, that we can just drop in and out every so often. Nice. Awesome. You're the worst bridge crew ever. <laughs> <laughs> or the best, contextually. Best. We can make it worse. <laughs> I'm sure we can make it worse. Righty. Excellent. Well, everyone, thank you for tuning in. This has been a special edition Gehenna Gaming Stream featuring the Darker's Day Radio crew, our friends all surrounding my face. And I think that's a wrap. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Uh...